uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. This is this is great we, that we finally get to meet. Of course, this is how we meet nowadays. Um, but uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and your organization and what you're passionate about? Sure, happy to do that. Um, well, my name is Lucy Turner. I'm speaking to you here from Manhattan in New York. I came here about five years ago after having worked um, with the UN in um, um, Geneva and in West Africa, the Middle East, um, the Pacific, in, in Asia, a little bit of voluntary work also. Wow, everywhere. San Quentin. Fantastic. <laughs> right. And, and the UN Secretariat is based just like 30 blocks away here. Um, and it's really the seat of power of the organization where, uh, uh, you know, policies, laws and decisions are made. So um, my role here was, was actually it's very interesting to help to share the innovations that I had discovered by working, especially with grassroots communities and organizations um, and institutions like government institutions on solutions to challenges related to extreme poverty. Mm -hmm in cycles of, of warfare and um, violence and, and injustice. And um, that remains my passion to work with people who own the problem to, to help them um, um, identify, um, implement and scale solutions so that solutions identified really at a very micro level can become the beauty of the UN. You were able to work with, with governments, with authorities to get um, significant funding and and you know multiple ministries behind a, an idea that originally began under you know a tree somewhere and um and more recently um to work with gov with businesses here businesses civil society organizations governments and the principle being that we each have different competencies to address challenges we face as humanity at this time business, civil society, government um, has different kinds of data, technology, resources to apply to these problems. So that's what I'm, uh, that's what I have done for um, focus on measurement of these solutions, by the way, to know which ones work for the last 10 years. Um, yeah, I've been with the UN for 14 and that same passion. It's useful and interesting to know about what the problems are we're all very aware of them and my passion was okay so what are we going to do <laughs> what works exactly <laughs> i mean it's 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 you're, you're right i mean we hear about these things but we uh, who is taking action what kind of actions are being are, are, are being taken and it sounds like it sounds like you have a dream job it's an absolutely beautiful job it's an absolutely beautiful job because um, hope comes from participating in hopeful actions. And so as much as, um, you know, a big part of my work, and you know, where you start, you, 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 you understand the problem as part of, you know, you're looking there, being curious, like for the seeds of the solution, or at least being able to support identification of the solution by understanding the problem. And my passion has always really been data. You know, how do we know uh, that that some things that proposed um, will work in this particular context? So that there's a lot of digging then into the problem. And when it's issues around poverty, injustice, violence, it's, it's, it can be quite horrible, actually. You know, mm -hmm. I did, um, uh, for some years working on violence against women in particular and in areas where there's been you know like in the case of Sierra Leone for example an 11-year war one of the most violent conflicts of the modern age you know it is it's 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 heartbreaking in a way oh yeah to be so exposed to this injustice and that's why it is so energizing and so wonderful to find which we have solutions because, I mean, in the case of Sierra Leone, well, we did, we have found a solution. And actually, by the way, international law, soft international law on what legal aid is and who can provide it, a long standing um, um, area of, of international practice has changed based on what we discovered. Really working with grassroots communities that way out, they don't even speak Creole, the national language of Sierra, of, of Sierra Leone. It's local language, understanding local problems and how they manifest in particular contexts, finding a solution to that. And then you have 
ministers, pri prime ministers, presidents here saying that we are going to do that and, and, and observing this and witnessing the change in individual lives and then in countries is absolutely phenomenal. It's a really, it's an absolutely wonderful way to live, partly for that, for that experience of hope and the energy that comes from participating in that and the people you meet along the way. Wow. I mean, same. people say that we're denting the universe here, but you're actually denting the universe. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Dying, aren't we? And I think, I think also a lot of us think, oh my gosh, you know, I'm no further forward now than I was. But I sometimes I think it's like, you know, when you're going for a walk, and you're like, oh gosh, it's dark now. You know, should we, should we have dinner? Should we go back? But it was getting dark the whole time. You just didn't notice. And so, mm -hmm, I, mean, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, like I say, in this particular um, um, organization um, uh, for, for 14 years, you know, I'm witnessing the change and stuck with a particular issue, you know, what witnessed actually some of that, um, we can go into this later about the importance of communicating data and communicating change. Things can change very quickly. Well, I'm curious. I, I love when you said the idea comes out from somewhere underneath a tree, because I think that's totally, totally true. I think sometimes first world nations have this conceit that, you know, all the good stuff comes from us, but I think that's completely wrong. I think there's good stuff everywhere and we just have to surface it. Are you finding that that's where you, you have the solutions, but the, the, sorry, you have the problems in these places, but the solutions are there too, right? So, yes, exactly. So this was, this is my key um principle i suppose underpinning what i do that um everyone is creative and everyone faces problems challenges in their life in their work in the places in which they travel do business live and it everyone either has ideas to support addressing those problems um or, or through a process can work together and in conversation frankly to find those solutions and my role um, should be about helping them to find those solutions. And there's two reasons why I'm um, passionate about that. One is on principle that I think it's about um, respecting people as it is. goes back way back in the sort of early political philosophy, you know, with Adam Smith saying that people are, re you know, reason um, that wanting to respect people's reason and, and people's um, uh, ownership of the problems they face and ownership of the solutions. And then it becomes purely practical because it's very difficult to implement solutions if people haven't felt part of the process. Um, and even if they go along with you in that, I think there's a kind of erosion of confidence and a disempowerment that I think ultimately gets in the way of progress. So, I, I, I think, yeah, like I say, I think it's a principal thing. The, the Charter of the United Nations is that this organization is it's the preamble of the UN Charter, that this organization is dedicated to the dignity and worth of the human person. So therefore, in the work I'm doing, I mean, it's uh, how, am I, how am I respecting the dignity and worth of the human person? I think it's like by asking, how can I help? How can I help? And what do you need from me? Um, let's see if we can work together to make something useful happen for your life. And, and then I said, again, on the practical side, we've learned this in international development. And I, and I, I, I dare say I, I haven't worked in, with the organizations you've worked with, but I would imagine the same is also true that if someone comes up with us, she's like, this is what we're going to do now. People are like, what? And who is this guy? <laughs> do you know? Exactly. So... <laughs> <laughs> That we we tried that before. That'll never work. Or you know, there's there's a myriad of reasons. Yeah. I think the the the, the, the thing that I find most interesting is that it's it's like every problem is solvable. It's just that I feel that whenever you see something in the world that's going wrong, there's some cohort of individuals who are okay with it like that, or they like it like that, and that's why it's staying like that. And you have to sort of break through that and go, how do we how do we change this? So that so that it can be changed and, and I mean you can't make everybody happy, but you can at least improve the life of of more people. Right, exactly. I do find that it's amazing um, 
what people will sign up for that actually wasn't it didn't look like it was in their interest I've really been amazed and I think finding ways for it to be in their interest um and also appealing 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 to everything right appealing to their pocket appealing to their reason and appealing to their heart I mean even I've been surprised at the kind of things you can pull off um and make people go along with things that one would have thought they would have resisted hmm. and again if they feel part of a pros and also if they can get a bit of prestige also so i don't know what part of the body would really right. i think in, mo in some cases that's more important right right exactly and what an important driver of change to be aware of you know when you're trying to um create change you know okay probably this is going to affect their pocket okay let's find a way to make it worth their while anyway and really appealing to that who was it that said that actually more good has been done in the world by offering people like the chance to have a name on like hospital wing than any kind of appeal to the social good or anything so um and i think you can be um judgmental of that you can just say look that's how it is if that's what it takes then go ahead we will um we will <laughs> we'll massage the ego what do you need it's true. I mean, I, I find that in, in almost all organizations that I work with, whenever you give a monetary reward, your uh, the ideas that you get are not as good as a prestige, prestige reward or innovator of the year, or an excellence award. Just standing that person in, up in front of everyone and going, hey, this guy is he came up with some amazing ideas is, is more money, more better than money in the bank for most people interesting yeah and it's 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 not a un, unpopular opinion people always think oh we, we have to give away free ipads or we have to give away uh free to free this or money or, or money or uh monetary rewards whatever but those ideas are never as good as the ones that are oh you're going to get this kind of recognition recognition seems to be more important than anything oh that's wonderful that's really wonderful to know i mean for two reasons i think um an award is an opportunity to celebrate and you know how wonderful is that that through a process yeah. of creating change which again is often like it is the starting point is is the problem but i mean the, the beautiful thing is that the, the better life the better way of working that comes and if that process can be accompanied with multiple celebrations brilliant absolutely so can you tell us a little bit about an uh a particular time when you you that you unearthed the idea and it, and actually made it through because you you were you were intimating earlier that there was something that that came from it underneath a tree and actually ended up being um, encoded by prime ministers or something like that. Can you give us an example of something like that that happened? Yeah, happy to. Um, and firstly, when I say underneath the tree, I mean this is. Uh, uh... <laughs> Sorry, I, I'm I'm just uh, oh, I'm I like nice. that phrase. <laughs> Yeah, um, uh, just to say also some of these things come from like small convenings like that are in quite um, humble spaces anywhere. I could say also in the UK where I'm from, originally I'm from Scotland. Um, um, or, you know, any kind of space where people can, can get together. So the why is always important, right? Actually mm -hmm. using the pain of, an ex of the problem, being aware of the problem because it's energy right and it's energy that you can really um you know um, put a fire under you to make something happen so my brother was coming home from work one day he just finished graduating um he just he was just about to graduate from the university of Edinburgh. he finished all his exams he was working in a, in a restaurant to try and make some money to go traveling he was walking up a very beautiful street actually i think it appears in the harry potter movies called victoria street he was rugby tackled to the ground, pulled into a fight, accused of having started that fight and facing prison for numerous charges. And um, he had said his story and he wasn't believed. And this trial was proceeding during which time, you know, as, a, as someone who's waiting to go out into the world, you know, with your credentials ready to go, of course, you want to apply for jobs, which is what everyone's doing. But he couldn't do that. All his cohort were going, applying for jobs, you know, working with big five consultants and firms, exciting careers beginning. 
And he couldn't fill in that part of the form that said, take care that you've got no charges pending against you. And I could see how he was kind of diminished. He's a confident guy and he's a big guy also, a rugby playing guy. Mm-hmm. And I could see the kind of damaging effect. It's horrifying, right? And the final day of his trial, I don't know what happened, but his legal aid lawyer, who, I mean, let's uh, be gracious. I'm sure the guy is very busy. It's an under-resourced function globally, wasn't available. And a more senior rank in the Scottish judicial system called a procurator fiscal was assigned his case. And he did the one thing my brother had been asking to look for evidence that what he said was true. And the procurator fiscal did that, found CCTV evidence showing that's it. He was walking along, pulled in the fight, and the case was thrown out of court. But that, I mean, it would have been one life or another. My brother, he currently lives in Singapore. He works, he, you know, in a, in a uh, tech firm, predictive analytics. He's doing very nicely. Thank you. He would have had a very different kind of life. And I just thought, here is... The system, the, I mean, it's the beginning part of government, security of justice anywhere. Now we have governments doing lots of things, but the original function was only that, security and justice. And this cluster of institutions that's responsible for the rule of law, like the basis of everything we have, perpetuating injustice, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. ruining lives. So I became aware that this problem really happens globally. So um, I went then, as it happened, that happened one summer, this would have been summer 2008, I went then to work in Sierra Leone, and the levels of, um, of injustice there, is just, it's, it's like Scotland but multiplied, because the country had been brought to its knees by 11 years of very violent warfare, so, you know, courts and police stations, these have been destroyed, and there was lack of trust also in, in, the, in, 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 in authority, because of the violence people had faced. So a lot of problems related to, to prison overcrowding, people found they've never been charged with anything but been there for 10 years, you know. So, and a particular problem um, related to violence against women, it was like a lot of the violence as the conflict had translated into just a, epidemic levels of violence against women. And um, we were doing what, we do as a government-led organization, a uh, government-run uh, uh, organization, U- United Nations Development Program, which I was working for, has an executive board, which is of member states, governments who run the UN here. And um, and we were so we were training judges, we were building police stations, we were building courthouses, um, um, we were, um, you know, um, implementing c- case management systems. And it happening for years, it'd been costing millions of dollars and actually well, not much was changing. In fact, mm. it was getting worse. Mm. So I mean, my, my belief is that all things are good, all things serve you. And I think that's true of boredom. Mm-hmm. So we, there was a certain level of kind of boredom. It's like, all right, so what do we do? So we asked community level organizations these people really in the farthest reaches of the country you know it's quite a few bus journeys to get there um you know where where um even the national language like creo so you'll be translating from english to creo to you know uh and and we said well you know what can what would you recommend we do to address this problem and it is um um what was suggested by community-based organizations really like we're talking grassroots is look most of the issues we face related to to um, conflict and where they start also it's like small kind of disputes so if we can just have some training and support to mediate those that would be great and then these more serious cases you know where they we we would want justice the sister is not working for us because we're not even going to go to the police station we've got no means to get there we don't know where it is we don't understand what rights we have like you've just uh, told us last week in one of your trainings that there's you know we have a right not to be raped we you know a lot of people didn't know that useful information if you could mm-hmm. share the information about what the law is what rights people have and then if they if those rights and um, uh, are violated if you could help them then to have just have someone like a community someone they know 
someone who speaks their language, someone who who has their level of pretty much, you know, education where they dress, someone they trust to work with them, to fill in the forms, to travel to the police station, to make statements, even provide like paper to the police station where they don't have it, then to keep going to court, provide, um, help them provide healthcare, help, help them to go to hospitals, etc. Then we'll be able to even reach this system and then we can also help the justice system to work correctly because we'll also have statements and, and, and support them to work well. Okay, so we did that. We ran grants and training for small community-based organizations to provide that really like accompaniment. It's like, I will help you, I'll hold your hand and we'll go through this entire process together because we know it's bewildering for everyone, the legal system. It's like, it's, it's a lot, especially for people who limited trust or, or exposure frankly to the government and limited levels of, of um, um, education and, and, and not understanding the language in which, in which justice is administered. So as I mentioned very briefly earlier, my I have a strong interest in, in well two things, stories and statistics because I think they're really powerful to promote change. So I, I love getting data. So I've been tracking all the data. So it came for me to write a report and um, what we found was that there was a 110% increase in prosecutions for gender-based violence in the year. Mm -hmm. And in addition to this, uh, I mean, I, I, I didn't want to, I was told to write a report, but I'm a British woman in Sierra Leone writing a report for donors in like the Netherlands and Norway and I thought I something not right about this I could spin anything couldn't I really so I would go and ask people and then I'd record the stories and mm -hmm. the stories were just so beautiful even one lady I remember she said tell God thank you for sake of UNDP thank God for UNDP and explain the story of, of the justice she'd got we were able to share those stories and the data um, at whatever kind of convening we had of access to justice professionals with our colleagues in New York. I then went on to work on this in Nepal and in other countries. I advised colleagues in Eritrea and Kenya and elsewhere. Um, so I told you it was 2008, no? September, uh, August 2008, I arrived in, in Sierra Leone. By 2012, new principles of, of legal aid had been developed. Mm. This proposal, whereby access to justice can be provided not only by qualified lawyers, but trained volunteers, the people who may have no, ed, you know, very limited formal education, let alone a law degree, can support the provision of justice and that resources for legal aid can go to this model, um, was endorsed by member states. Then more recently, this is going... Uh, when we have the, you know, the Sustainable Development Goals, SDG 16, on peace, justice, and sustainable institutions, we've had the leaders of the government of Sierra Leone and multiple other countries that copied this um, innovation, adapted it for their purposes, here in the UN Secretariat, as uh, the, um, and, 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 and coordinating a global campaign, Pathfinders for Justice, around this, uh, this idea. Wow, yeah, fantastic. Yeah, some of the most powerful people in the world, but it's not their idea. Mm -hmm. It's not their idea. It came from these beautiful ladies really thinking, yeah, this is really tough. I mean, we don't really, you know, sometimes want to leave our houses. We're not safe. Um, we don't really think that what you're doing is going to work, but we do have some solutions for you. How about this? Shall we give it a go? Yeah. Experiment. Yeah. Why not? Give it a try and see what happens. But I'm assuming that you had a lot of pushback that we had when, when, like, how did you deal with pushback on this? Because there's always people who want to keep things the way they are. Yeah, such a good point. Yes, there was, um, how are you going to manage quality? You don't want these people, you know, uh, um, and also the role of traditional leaders who can, uh, uh, you know, provide certain, form, you know, their, 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 their form of governance, really, including administration of justice and some of their practices are not aligned with human rights also, how we can, mm -hmm. and I, and we heard a lot of that, that was quite a, um, a big drumbeat. Again, what we did there was um, 
speak to reality, Chris, and have those people who are more familiar with the reality make the case to say, look, we understand, you know, that it's not the way you would like it to be. And yet this is the reality. Like the reality is this is how it is. And these, um, until, it, you know, we have kind of utopia where everything's functional, let's work with the reality, imperfect though it is, and what you're describing, like all the issues you're describing, let's mitigate those and work towards a model where we have exactly what it is you want and the, the re where the resistance comes from wanting something different. Let's work towards that something different, engage with the reality that we cannot achieve that now. You know, we're an entire country with 25 qualified lawyers. It's not going to happen. Low level mm -hmm. trust institution. Let's build it and le let's allow it to take time. Right. And that, so you were able to so present it's like a simple, simple solution, which would lead towards. So it's like, here's your ideal state, but we, there's no way we can go straight there. Exactly. And, and, and don't make them wrong. Don't make them wrong. So it's like, yes, yes. What you say is true. All of those things you've said are true. And so what you're wanting, if I understand, and is, is like the formal justice system to function effectively. Everything's aligned, efficient, effective, aligned with human rights. And yet we can see because of this reality, which I've described to you as vividly as I can, that we're not, you know, let, let's define a process that meets the needs now and works towards what you want. So then people aren't shoved to one side, right? So they, they know that what they want is important and, and that it's, we're still going for it. They're by no means excluded. Um, and then particular measures to achieve what they wanted in their kind of you know, perfect state now. So um, particular um, training and support for um, um, awareness raising for customary justice leaders to align their practices with human rights. And I think also not waiting. So I don't know it's the case that some people want to point out issues and, and offer critique and critique is useful and that mm -hmm. there are other or like let's just get the hell on with things but it might be true so while we were thinking about and having those discussions like to deal with the critique and build up our model and the you know these things are important too um policy documentation and, and guidance and all of this which involves a lot of discussion i was continuing to just be active on this like guiding colleagues in in, in other country offices who'd heard about it from convenings about how to do it and so ultimately we had like a fleet of what you would, as you would say, experiments. So real, as reality is kind of moving forward and the, and the good results are being shown, then in a way, when you've got that combination of powerful stories of people saying, thank God for your NDP and data like 110% shift in the issue you want to achieve through this different model, I think through that combination of things, there's a way to bring people along on the journey. Right, but it sounds like you have to you have to try these experiments and show some positive evidence of the experiment, like you were saying to describe it. It's interesting what you mentioned reality because um, I, I also do some philosophy and I, I always have an issue with reality because it's interesting what you mentioned earlier about the CCTV cameras and how that basically depicts reality. And once the reality was presented, then people say, "Oh, I can see what's obviously happening here." But a lot of times you don't have that kind of evidence. And you can just, I mean, you just short show numbers or you tell stories. How do you how do you get them to understand that this is this is the reality? Um well, I think I think stories and statistics can really do it. If you are a really good storyteller, I tell so as it happened when I went back to Scotland to actually to kind of record some of these experiences and um um decompress I think a bit from from working in the um you know without kind of basic things like electricity and you know and plenty about I heard to check Facebook when you're <laughs> <laughs> right exactly um um for whatever reason I was really attracted to the storytelling center in Edinburgh so and it hosts a global storytelling network and my I think I've changed your I was I don't know why you know it's maybe not really my thing but nonetheless I put myself in that room and I can't believe it because I tell you, with these storytellers, you're not going to move. You're not going to go to the toilet. You're not going to rustle for some sweets. You're not moving your jacket. 
you're not uncrossing, crossing, you are frozen in the spot and you're not there. You're in this mm -hmm. other world that they've created. And I was both, uh, you know, enjoying myself being in this kind of, you know, being enchanted with what they were doing. And it's like a one man thing. It's like them and their arms and their facial expressions. I mean, it's limited resources and impressed. And I thought, gosh, wouldn't it be wonderful to be able to do that in the business of creating global change so that people come into a, you know, a conference from here or a committee, a committee meeting, and they don't just hear a statement being read, but they're the way they think and the way they feel has changed in that moment and possibly thereafter. So what I have found is that um, through telling those stories, like recording those stories in the context in which the person was and their story, and weaving in statistics, it's like, which isn't a small thing, by the way. I mean, I'd really go continually to police stations and the prosecutor's office and the courts, like again and again, because you know, one day the print is not working or the person with the relevant data is not there, or, you know, it's a really quite a thing to get the data or, or um, it, it can be. Um, but that would disarm critique and show that really, you know, the head has some data to munch on and the heart has also a human story. It's like, are you going to make this person who's saying it work for them wrong? Yeah, it's amazing how how powerful storytelling telling is. But we we constantly, I think we we, we seem to have trans, transmuted from a world of story to a world of data, right? And I think we're slowly realizing that the story is more almost more important than data. Is more is more important than the data because that's how you touch people. Exactly. So I've been banging the drum on data for, for quite some years. Um, and I, day, you know, and I will never minimize it because it's been hugely significant to affect um, and support, you know, improve justice and hence reduce levels of poverty in, in many countries that I've worked in. I've been involved in helping to get those data. Um, I can say more about the data stuff even from this past year actually so it's hugely powerful and one thing i'm concerned about now is that there's so much of it and the question of data use i think is something that we need to think about um particularly and that has a lot to do with distribution and communication you know like how you present it in 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 short snappy like infographics and in compelling ways but also critically how are you embedding it in human stories that enable people to make sense of it? Because as much as we're becoming different kinds of human in a way because of technology and technological capabilities, including, you know, phenomenal insights, phenomenal insights we can get through, you know, having tetrabytes and more of uh, access to data um, of, of, on, on massive scale we still relate to stories told eye to eye you know mind to mind heart to heart and when we're in the business of making change we of course make a case because we must because we're rational beings and we're not only rational beings we're also emotional and feeling beings and social beings and so in terms of creating change humanizing the story of change is and will always be critically important and to make sense of data i think it's something we need to reprioritize to support to really realize the potential of the data actually so people understand what it means and the significance of it yeah because that's you're right i mean that's not really happening but it's almost like you're saying that the story, the story is almost more important than the data, because if you don't present the story correctly, it's, it's misinterpreted or something's, something's wrong. I mean, I feel like we're moving into a, a situation where we're using the data to create stories, but we can also disconnect the data from the story and create whatever story we want. And I think that's, that's where there might be a real danger. Yes. And, you know, we've one of the threads of our discussion here has been on resistance and critique and we welcome it because it makes us have to be better right. and it introduce, you know, important um, considerations that enrich our analysis and enrich our solutions. So um, 
not to minimize the importance of that. Um, but data, I mean, the reason why people resist data is because they don't want data. Mm -hmm. do not want to lose control of the narrative and that's it you know why, yep. why we're using data is because it's so expensive yeah it can be expensive does it take time mm -mm, absolutely Pol politics mm -hmm. do people are we, people willing to surrender um control of the narrative um that is a tricky thing um and again this you know we are human so the, the 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 weaknesses in the human character will always exist <laughs> <laughs> well i think i think the thing is it's like data data is reality and we we i think we specialize in as human beings we specialize in trying to manipulate our reality to make make it go the way we want so when we're when we're, confront, when we're con confronted with actual reality we're like at first we're like i don't believe that you know, I'm going to believe whatever I want. <laughs> right? It's not true. <laughs> and then eventually they're like, oh, wait a minute. Okay, there's enough reality here for, to make me change my mind. And it's almost like you need, a, you need a profusion of reality to say, okay, now I can start thinking different. <laughs> right. And I think that's, that's the real use of, um, you know, the, these fleets of experiments because then you can – you know bomb, bomb bombard people with multiple forms of reality and then of course um the community that's created around that and i think that there's something about that i mean we need that i mean we're here with and for each other you know actually so i've listened to a lot you can imagine no? i've listened to a lot of statements and read a lot of reports and often these are giant things they're getting shorter you know yeah i bet <laughs> Sometimes you wonder, like, all you do is create paper. But no, you don't just create paper. <laughs> it's a huge, this is a huge volume of stuff. I remember, uh, um, I don't know that I've ever heard kind of the business case for the UN stated better than the, um, an electronic music act for very big <laughs> in the UK in the 90s with a band called Faithless and this epic performance at a place called Glastonbury. You may have heard of it. And in the end, Maxi Jazz is the headman said, look after each other yeah we're all we've got and so that's, that's awesome that's, i love that <laughs> so that's why i mean i mean really elena roosevelt would have loved that i'm sure um so so i mean that's why i do what i do why you do what you do you're like let me help you make your life and work better and also so there's that aspect we're drawn to help one another also we want this experience um of 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 being with each other i mean how nice you and i are having this conversation and i don't know if it's true for you but some of the greatest friends i have are from people who were seated around a table but okay let's see how we figure this out and we figured out the thing but we also began oh, yeah. friends. absolutely absolutely well see there's one thing that sort of strikes me uh, as we're trying to move positive change throughout the world is that so many people are afraid of change, any kind of change, really. And it, I mean, do you have any strategies on how to help people through change? I know you were mentioning earlier, you can show it what's, what's in it for them and how they can, you know, it's better for everyone. Do you have any other strategies you could, you could share? Oh, strategies to deal with change. Well, to how to how to deal with people's fear of change, because I think that's sort of like the default human. There's a couple of default human states that I think we have where we're, we're, we're kind of lazy, like we want to do some people call it resource conservation, but I call it laziness. <laughs> so we want to do the minimum amount of work and get the maximum amount of thing out of it. And then the other piece of it is that when things change, even if it's a positive change, we're all, oh, my God, I can't. You know, it it throws me, even if it's a positive change. So how do we get people to fear change less? Because I think that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to change change things, but there's always a contingent of people who are like, that's new, that's different, that's unknown. I've never seen that before. It's probably bad, you know, but how do we get them to fear the change less? Mm -hmm. The vision, Chris. Mm -hmm. The vision. Um, so I'm from an island off the west coast of Scotland. It's called Isla. So if you're into whiskey, you will definitely know of it. Because oh, I, I, Talisker is my favorite. <laughs> wonderful okay so 
we make a hell of a lot of whiskey where I'm from. Um, and so uh, it's, it's a little far away from, I mean, you drive from Edinburgh a few hours, then you get a boat for a few more hours and then you drive from, 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 the, from the ferry terminal. Um, and sometimes it's a bit choppy. Mm -hmm. And I remember one particular journey. I think in retrospect, they probably wish they hadn't done the sailing, right? But it was very choppy. Now, my father was entirely unfazed because he was a captain of ships. My grandfather was a captain of ships and my uncle, that's what everyone's done. And he, everyone was hurling everyone, like lying down. And he said, <laughs> he said to me, Lucy, keep your eye to the horizon because it's the only thing that doesn't move. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, I did. And I was fine, enjoyed the journey. And from time to time, I've thought about that. And I've also seen the power of letting people know where we're going because the, the process of change is hard. It's like when you redecorate your house, you're like, I think we can improve this place. And then you start to, and you're like, oh, it's worse than ever. You know, it, gosh, <laughs> it always goes through that period of worse than ever before it yeah, gets better. Why is <laughs> hanging out with crap everywhere? Like the builder leaves this, I don't know, do we need this bucket? You know, so, and then ultimately it's better than ever. So the, the change, change is the unbeautiful part of pro, you know, progress is that you see, and I've seen it in countries also, like the immense upheaval and for me that meant you know going going to work in a convoy like streets surrounded by protesters you know various lockdowns um not being able to get food because certain regions bread basket region not providing it, letting people know the vision and in particular this is what we're moving towards this is what we're moving towards and in a way it's like we have if it's a resource conservation we have a certain amount of bandwidth so if so much of your attention is focused on a vision you believe in and you're quite excited about living in, there's just less to pay attention, like to the wires falling out and all the kind of buckets and the dust sheets. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, that's a temporary situation and you, you have that you have that future vision to look for. Exactly, exactly. I love it. So and so so um, you and I and, and anyone who's um, a kind of captain of change, right, or or um, to keep reminding people of that and to keep that in mind ourselves like this is it this is where we're headed then we're not hurling over the side and we can say to one it's okay this is <laughs> i love it <laughs> that's a great that's a great analogy all right well speaking of the future and what's happening next okay so it's the year 2032 it's 10 years from now mm. where will we be mm, what a good question i believe we will return to simpler pleasures even as the world is more kind of complex mm. i think simpler things like um knitting pottery board games um things that are experiences mm. of, of create individual creativity and kind of like peace um and also connection will become a bigger part of our lives so analog things frankly uh um paper books um and experiences that are unrelated travel i mean we saw that 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 actually i mean we all bought a lot of stuff right because and funny <laughs> that sort of dope for me and i've seen i don't even think it's just an american thing i know it's not just an american thing i mean um, thrift shops in where my uh, hometown are like absolutely full and declining donations here I see storage like is a massive industry right oh yeah but you're yeah. right I mean thrift shops here it, it's like every day there's huge piles of stuff out there people people are definitely losing things hopefully they're not replacing them or, or doubling <laughs> up on new things so I mean one of the experiences of, like having a lot of, of stuff and but buying things I think that's that began to reduce slightly and, and um, people crave more experiences. And a lot of that has been related to travel, not so possible during um, COVID. I think people started to pick up other things, a lot of cooking. Um, and um, I think, I think a lot more 
people will become a lot more creative and it will become a lot more of an expression of our humanity, a way we spend our time and enjoy connecting to each other. So I think another thing that we, as in terms of experience is like eating, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I wonder about whether we'll find a way to connect around something that isn't food. I, I don't know if you've had I would love to do that. (laughs) My scale tell screams at me every morning. (laughs) Right. I mean, there's only, I don't know if you've had days like this, you're like, I don't want to have anything more to eat. But my mom's like, oh, here, have a sandwich. Like, didn't we just eat like an hour ago? <laughs> okay. Well, I'm just... so so I it's think more like, it's... oh, we're, we're talking about dieting. And then we're like, oh, we have this dinner and then we have that lunch and we have this dinner and that lunch. And I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> it's a lot. It's really a lot. So I think, um, and travel, I think will continue to be, I mean, always be a beautiful thing, but a bit more um, challenging. And I think, you know, probably actually by 2032, there'll be more kind of travel experiences you can do with VR. Like maybe the, the kind of municipality of Venice would shut down the city for a day to record a VR experience so people can have that experience. Oh, wow. And then the reality of going there would be that there's like a zillion tourists and you're like, oh my God, take me out of this, you know? <laughs> um, so, and it's, it's funny like, how when you tra- actually travel, the experience is completely different from what you expect it to be because there's just so many people <laughs> right no exactly so i think the kind i think um i think analog experiences and creative expression will become a bigger part of people's experience you know yeah, i think it- what you said sorry go ahead okay, go ahead no, i was thinking you were interested it's interesting you mentioned that because it's you, you've heard the great resignation where people are taking more critical looks at their careers and their jobs and their lives and what they're doing and maybe going, this is not what I, what I want to do. And I think that's leading part, partly into this is that people are starting to realize that they don't, what they're doing now is not what they really want. And they're moving into these fields where they, they can be more creative and do more of what they enjoy as opposed to just working for money. Exactly. Exactly. And I think that's been a missing part of the human experience. Oh, it sounds very grand and you know, to say that. <laughs> no, but I think you're right. I mean, <laughs> and it's interesting that this cr- this crisis sort of drove us to that because I think we were going there eventually because people maybe in dribs and drabs were unhappy with their lives and were sort of peeling off and sort of leaving the career path and doing their own thing, but in in small doses. And then when this happened, it's it, it was almost like a wake up call. Wait a second, is this really what I want to be doing? And it it actually so on the on the one hand it was horrible but on the other hand there were some good things that came out of it as well absolutely and i think it relates a little bit it's nice that we're coming to this you know towards the end now at the beginning this idea that like, everyone is creative and that creativity can be applied to addressing the problems in their lives through identifying the solutions and it's also it's it's really part of our humanity and for me that's always been I, I I just knew it because um did I tell you why? Because so I'm from this island off the west coast, Isla, and every Saturday we would get ready for what's called a Kaylee. So it's like a communal social celebration. Um, the, the literal meaning in Gaelic, it's a Gaelic word, is is visit or like party. So they come together and dancing together is the main thing. Some of the formations are in two, some of them are in four, six, eight, you know, some of the, you know, by the end of the evening, you, you, some of them are with everyone in the room. Um, and in between there are different offerings, I suppose you could say, someone will play an instrument, someone will do a skit, someone will tell a story, someone will perform a little play, someone will do like a, a, a dance there on the stage. What else will people do? Um, sing a song. And so my Saturdays, it was like, are you working on your thing? And I'd be working on my thing to do on Saturday night. (laughs) And um, It's like a talent show. I love it. (laughs) (laughs) And so it's a way to entertain yourself and to um, strengthen social connections. I suppose I enjoy um, uh, creating social connections um, where there's no distinction between a performer and an audience, between an artist and a consumer of art every one is doing something mm-hmm. everyone is doing something and so I really grew up with this thinking like Kaylee like what's my what's my thing or what am I doing creatively and feeling like there's something missing and if 
there is something that is essential to you, like your humanity, and you're not doing that. And for me, I believe it's creativity. Like, I don't have the thing that, well, I'm not an artist, therefore I'm not doing art. I'm like, I'm a human, therefore I'm creating. Exactly. <laughs> so I think that's exactly. a bigger part of people's experience, that it will be whatever. And it, it might be because a person was part of the great resignation and they were like, I think I want to make pots and sell those on Etsy or have a gallery or whatever. Um, or, you know, display ultimately at the Met or have an opening at a big gallery. It could be that. Or it might just be that I will continue to do like a form of what I used to do. And this will be part of my experience of life. And with that, I feel whole and complete. And I've left yeah. my job to create. You know, we don't know why we do things. It's like Steve Jobs said, you can only join the dots in retrospect. I think we make these significant changes because we know there is a part of our humanity. There's like an unmet need we're trying to fulfill. And we're in a process of like trying to, I believe, reclaim our full humanity. And that's what justice is part of that. Like our full humanity is living in a just society and, 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 and living well. And I think creativity and, 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 and hence and analog experiences will become a bigger part. So we'll, it's like we've had this giant kind of, whoa, technology, thank you. And then, you know, I love it. And I think I'll manage this impulse to grab my phone and maybe. <laughs> <laughs> if we could only do that more often. I'm, I love paper books, by the way. I think they've never gone away and they should, they should be here forever. But you're right. I think, I think I see, I hope I see more people stepping away from the devices and realizing what they're doing to us in there. I think we went, we've gone through sort of... Um, some kind of an, ev an evolution to the point where the devices used to be neutral and now and sometimes they're negative and sometimes they're positive. And I, I would like to see them go back to being more neutral. And at the same time that we have the will and the ability to sort of step away from them and do something else. Like, like you said, take a walk or. <laughs> no, so I don't know what, I mean, what is coming off this? It's like this draw. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Well, that's the thing. Some people say, I mean, if you think about it, the, it, they use data and algorithms to suck us in, right? If there's, they should just, if they could turn their, their power to good, then it's probably, that would be great. <laughs> right, exactly. And I think, I, th I wonder, I don't know about this. I wonder if um, engaging in creative things can actually increase your resilience to that. Not necessarily because it strengthens your willpower, so to say, but because you become so aware of what a pleasurable experience is over there at your easel or at your desk. Yep. I mean, for me, uh, related to this, I, I got more into writing. I thought this, I was, you know, big into data, did multiple national surveys, you know, huge. I'm still thrilled thrilled you know like my heart starts pumping like huge pages of data you know in a big roll <laughs> uh, you know I I started to get more into storytelling um and I discovered that it's just so wonderful that actually mm. I'm so aware of the pleasure of being like pen and paper anywhere because you're not there you're somewhere else <laughs> <laughs> um that actually i'm i'm much more relaxed a friend said this over there it's nice to be with you because you're not checking your phone the whole time and i i didn't know that, <laughs> that was quite easy here but i think it's because i'm so i'm so aware now of how lovely it is now to be with pen and paper doing my creative thing which is writing i love it i love it well thank you so much this has been great i love it great conversation if somebody wants to get in touch with you what's the best way uh lucy at lucyturner.org Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. It's been great talking with you. Great. Talking we should do this again. <laughs> yes, definitely. Have a Absolutely. great day. You too. Bye. Thank you so much.